Well, greetings, friends. It's Danielle Smith. Welcome to another AEG podcast. This one is we're starting a really exciting series interviewing the leadership candidates. And as we know, for the Conservative Party of Canada, it is a hotly contested race. So we've got two candidates this week. I sat down with them earlier in the week. They were very generous with their time. And I want to, to uh, present them to, to both of you. So we're going to do things a little bit differently this today. I'm just going to introduce them. We will hear the, the, the first interview with Jean Charest, former premier of Quebec. And also he was a, the former leader at once, once upon a time of a federal conservative party as well, and had a, a history as a, a cabinet minister also. So he's got some really interesting insights, having seen things from both the federal and provincial perspective. And of course, Dr. Leslin Lewis, who had a huge surge of popularity in Alberta. So I know our Alberta audience is going to be very interested in what she has to say. The world, of course, has changed so dramatically since both of these individuals were in office before. For. But let's begin by uh, bringing in Jean Charest. All right, greetings and welcome to this edition of a series of interviews with the Conservative Party of Canada leadership candidates. We are starting off with a person who will be well known in many different roles that he's had, not only Deputy Premier or Deputy Prime Minister, uh, but also uh, he was Environment Minister way back in the day. He also was the Premier of Quebec, and he's jumping back in to try to be Prime Minister of Canada. I'm talking about uh, Monsieur Jean Charest, and he joins us now. Mr. Charest, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Daniel. Real pleasure to see you again. Now, of course, the, the big question will be, why are you jumping back <laughs> in again? You have had a very long career in politics. This is the time <laughs> to go off into being the statesman and give advice to uh, all the new up-and-comers. Why do you want to be back into it? Well, it, it boils down to the country, to Canada, and and you and I have known each other for years. You know, the common theme of my whole political life has been the idea of Canada. I was, uh, you know, fought the referendum of 95. I went on to uh, Quebec politics to uh, lead the coalition of federalists under the Liberal Party to uh, to fight for Canada. And I look at the country now, Danielle, and, you know, I think we're probably more balkanized, more divided today than we were in the in the early 80s. And I also see the Conservative Party of Canada uh, fractured. And, and if there's anything that's urgent is for the Conservative Party of Canada to be the national party that it is destined to be, and uh, that Canadians want us to be so that we can form a government and be a real national government and allow this country to meet its full potential. Yeah, I, I should let people know, full disclosure, I was a Jean Charest delegate back in 1992 in that in that leadership contest. And I, I want to know what you think about how conservatism has changed since that time. What was the big difference ah. in, in, in those days versus today? It, it's an interesting question. And a political party is an institution that's a, a living institution that by the way is marked by all the leaders who are in in charge of the party so a political party isn't static then yet it moves and it changes and evolves with time it's the basic values that anchor the party and today we're, we're living in of course a world that is totally different a, a world where wedge politics in the united states seems to be the order of the day which we don't want in canada and the conservative party itself needs to adapt to this new world we're facing issues that are quite different energy, economic development, fiscal conservatism, uh, climate, all these issues are quite different from the ones that we were facing only a few years ago. So, but the party itself, if you're the leader, you take the party as is, you assume that party with its, its legacy, which includes the Harper years, which were very good years economically for the, uh, the country. He left a very solid legacy or even Preston Manning and Mulroney and all, all of these leaders, when you put them together, define who we are today, the DNA. And that DNA needs now to move and to be used based on or anchored on our values to, to offer Canadians policies that will allow the country to grow. Let's talk about our Canada's place in the world. I want to sort of start internationally and then and bring it up uh, local. So first of all, obviously, crisis in, in Ukraine with the Russian invasion, huge humanitarian issues. And, and our foreign policy seems to have, be along three lines. There's 
What is our commitment on defense and are we meeting it? What is our commitment on foreign aid and providing that kind of refugee support and are we meeting it? And increasingly people are talking about, does Canada have a role to play in providing energy security to the world and then particularly to our friends and allies in Europe? So why don't we take each one of those and, and you can tell me yeah. your view. You, you wrote an article in The Line about where you see us being on the, on the defense front. Are, are we meeting our obligations? Well, we're not. And uh, here, the, you know, the crisis in Europe and the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia has now shed a very bright light on that. And Canada is a, a country that has a northern uh, border with Russia. And all of a sudden, I think a lot of people are waking up to the fact that we are not doing what is needed and required to occupy our own territory, to do our share in the world. Doing our, what does our, doing our share mean? Uh, in, within NATO, in which Article 5 provides for all of us to stand with each other if one of us is attacked, says that we need to at least invest 2% of our GDP in defense. We're below that. I think we're probably in the range of 1.4, and it depends how you calculate it, but we're below. So we have to spend more on defense for ourselves, by the way, Danielle. It isn't just about defending someone else. For ourselves first. And then we have to increase the number of troops. Uh, we're probably at 60,000 up to 100,000. I think we have to go up north uh, with our defense capabilities. We have to affirm and occupy our territory if we're going to be a, a sovereign country. And so on the defense side, and we have to clean up our procurement uh, for mm -hmm. buying planes. And it's been very complicated, by the way, under all governments, not just the more recent one, but all governments have had difficulty on procurement. So those are the things we have to, uh, to look after. Well, one of the things that the current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said is, well, maybe we're not meeting our commitments on defense, but you've got to look at the holistic picture that we do a lot on foreign aid and providing support for, for displaced citizens when, when they do leave war zones. Is, is that legitimate? Do you think that's a good argument? Well, and, and on these issues, Danielle, you know, you don't, when you leave the shores of Canada, we don't go elsewhere to, to fight partisan battles. And we don't want this to be partisan, really, mm -hmm. when we're abroad and whether on, on foreign aid issues, we, we should all as Canadians and the parties be able to, to be able to have a view that we're share and, uh, out with the outside world. On, on aid, we can do more. I mean, we, and we can do it differently. We can do it in ways that will uh, support. We're missing an action, Danielle, in a lot of places mm -hmm. in the world, in Africa, in the Middle East. And I know I've, I've traveled in those areas. I've worked in those areas. Uh, we, are, we are just not consistent. Our brand is good. I mean, Canada's brand is strong. I mean, there's no one who argues with that. But our presence is has been very haphazard, inconsistent, and that's one of the things that would change under my government. I think we'd want a strong presence in different parts mm. of the world and continue to uh, offer some ODA, some good ODA. Uh, and, and ODA works when it's done right, by the way. We can eradicate diseases. We can reduce poverty if we are intelligent and smart about the way we do it. Okay, let, let's talk about um, the, the geopolitical shift that we're seeing. I'm interested in, in knowing your thoughts on it, because I feel like the government has been trying to, to straddle the, the fence by maintaining a relationship with the United States, but wanting to reach out to China. Now we've got this additional complicating factor with, with Russia. What is Canada's place in the world as a, a mid-range power? Who, who should be our principal ally and trading partner? Sh should we be retrenching with our U.S. Uh, friends and neighbors and the Commonwealth countries and, and trying to distance ourselves from this new alliance forming between China and Russia? Can we be friends with everyone? H how do you see it? Well, we, we are not allies with everyone. I mean, that's the, uh, and let me, I'll start with the United States. Obviously, geography has its own uh, realities. We are physically next to the United States. They are our friends, our allies, our neighbors. We're very lucky to have each other as neighbors at the end of, even with all the problems we may have with the United States, Danielle. And they are the richest economy in the world. So very naturally, we're going to continue to have a dominant relationship with them. That's that's not going to change. The world around us has changed, though, a lot. Mm -hmm. China's become a superpower. And I'm glad you mentioned it, because one of the issues in this campaign is the issue raised uh, that I had represented uh, Huawei, which is true, mm -hmm. and I did some work for Huawei. <clears throat> By the way, in all the work I did with any client, I never did anything that I felt was contrary to the interest of Canada. That would just be contrary to my own life. And in the case of Huawei, I helped and uh, assisted the family of Michael Corrid and helped find a solution so that we could help 
bring the two Michaels back home. So I'm, I'm proud of that. And, uh, but in a case, let me return to China. China is a superpower, Danielle. It is now a superpower that behaves like a superpower with all the impulses, which means that we as Canadians have to take uh, our, our measurement of that and make sure that we defend our own values and our own interests. It means we have to look at the uh, Indo-Pacific area at large, not just China, put it in the context of India, of ASEAN, of Southeast Asia. These are all the things that Canada has to revisit because a lot of, uh, of our interests are gonna be played out in that uh, corner of the world. So it's gonna call, call for a, a rethink of our foreign policy and a, and a very serious rethink of our relationship with the United States and how we diversify trade, for example. Those are the things I see on my radar screen. Let's let's bring it closer to home, though, because I think one of the reasons why we have a, a bit of a chaotic foreign policy is that different regions in the country are aligned with different countries in a in a uh, in in a economics and investment. And I think that there's a very strong sense that there are a, a lot of Quebec-based businesses that have really deep ties with China. Does that does that complicate the discussion about where we should be uh, focusing our effort in creating more business partnerships? Well, it should not be, our, our policy should not be dictated by either one region of the country or, or, or one particular area of business. Frankly, it's a, it's a very much an overall picture we have to look at in the interest of all the country. British Columbia, for example, has a vested interest in having open trade links with all of Asia because geographically they're advantaged by that and, and actually they do. And so, and for example, the owner, the energy sector, the oil patch uh, has a vested interest in having open uh, trade with Asia also to sell natural gas and sell oil, those where the markets are. So I, we, can, we can look at the bigger picture. I don't see any particular region dominating. Now, we did a trade deal with Europe. I'm the one who initiated the Canada-Europe trade deal. Mm. It was thought that this is a lot about Eastern Canada because geographically it's closer. But really, what's really, if you dig a bit more, what's really at play here, if you put Europe and North America together is, as, a, as a trading block, is who's going to dictate the terms of trade? Who's going mm -hmm. to establish rules? And if we're smart again with the United States, with all of America and with Europe, by having a trading block that is united and uh, cohesive, we are the ones who could set the rules of trade as opposed to having them imposed on us by an emerging superpower like China. Okay, let's um, let's talk a bit. I want to I want to explore the issues of energy security, and I appreciate that you've acknowledged how important this is to Alberta. Um, what, I'll start by by talking about the obvious tension that there is between um, Alberta's interests and Quebec's interests on almost every issue regarding energy, net zero climate change, CO2 reduction, you almost end up with polar opposites between what Quebec wants and, and what Alberta wants. More recently, of course, we've seen uh, active advocacy by Quebec-based politicians against Energy East. They ultimately pulled the plug on that. We saw the cancellation of the Saguenay LNG project. We hear Francois Legault talking about pulling the uh, exploration leases for oil and gas companies, which are impacting members uh, in, of ours in, in Alberta. And I, I'm wondering if you see a pathway forward to marrying those interests. I felt like there was such a strong argument to make that, um, that Quebec still has a very strong relationship with Europe. It has a role to play in being able to provide energy security to our friends and neighbors in Europe. And yet that argument doesn't seem to be breaking through. What, what are we missing? We're missing a champion. We're missing someone. And, and that's, I witnessed all of what you've described in Quebec, whether on Energy East or GNL, uh, Saguenay GNL. And there's no, there hasn't been anyone in Quebec for years now getting standing up and saying, this is a good idea and we need to do it. And here's why. And, uh, and again, this terrible conflict in Ukraine has brought all of this home. I mean, we, we should be able to supply natural gas to Europe and be an alternative, a good ethical alternative, but we're not because we weren't wise enough. We weren't, we didn't have leadership that could anticipate enough to be able to do that. But you know, what's really been missing, Danielle, it's been someone who stands up. It's been either Quebec. We haven't had that since I've been in office because I was in favor of pipelines. The last pipeline built in Quebec was built under my government in favor of an oil and gas, but we haven't had that since. And the prime minister of our country has never got up and said, I believe in the oil and gas industry. I believe in pipelines. 
Uh, instead, it's been the contrary. That's been, and the message has been received by the marketplace. I mean, they they know the prime minister doesn't have his heart into it. So we should, in this conflict, take a, a, a very cold, make a very cold, uh, not cold, but a rather sober, I should say, assessment of where we are, and realize that we have a role to play. And uh, and now let's look at these projects under the right light, and and make them and and see whether we can make them happen. I don't know whether Energy East will ever happen again because you know it, it's just uh, was a project that wasn't able to find any spokesperson in, in Quebec but uh, there will be other projects and I think we need to look at them all on an individual basis under this new light. What about fracking? There's been such an active campaign to try to keep natural gas in the ground. How, how would you address that issue in Quebec today? Well, I was in government when the fracking uh, story appeared for the first time. We were surprised by it. And you know what the basic problem was, Danielle, for us? There is no culture of oil and gas in Quebec. I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. There's, it's a hydro culture. Quebecers know hydroelectricity inside out. They know it in their guts. They know it intuitively. But oil and gas, I mean, frankly, I mean, for them, it's like planet Mars. And, mm -hmm. and that's what allowed the debate to go off uh, the rails. And there was, you know, some, some, as soon as consultations started, the industry did consultations that finally ended up uh, turning uh, very negatively. And so I don't, you know, in the short term, I don't think you'll see fracking in Quebec because of that, because that horse has already left the barn. And, uh, but the same thing happened in the state of New York. The same thing happened in all other places where, frankly, people were just not ready to look at what the industry was. By the way, I've seen parallels in the mining industry. You know, in the mind, we, we talk about electric batteries, electric cars and batteries now. You know what? You need mining to be able to mine lithium and cobalt and graphite. And, they, and there's people, the same environment groups will tell you they don't want the mines. They want the batteries, they want the electric, but they don't want the mine. Well, I'm sorry, you don't get any electric cars unless there is batteries that... Uh, and the places where mines are the most acceptable for people is where there are mines because they know what it is. They live next to it. And the same is true, you can see it in Alberta with oil and gas. People aren't as scared of it. They, they live it, they see it. They know that it's something that is, uh, when well-managed, is, uh, is something that's good for the whole community. And, and, and then we can manage in a spirit of decarbonizing our economy, as long as we're smart about it. Let, let's talk a bit about that because I'm I'm trying to put a read on the current government to see whether there, we've had a breakthrough or not. On the one hand, we've seen in Europe that they are allowing for green bonds uh, for nuclear as, as well as for natural gas, especially with carbon capture, and I think that's very yep. positive. And yet, it sounds like that still isn't allowed here. However, you had uh, Jonathan Wilkinson and Stephen Lego uh, Stephen Gilbo say that they uh, would allow for an investment tax credit because we need to have carbon technology for capture, utilization and storage at a massive scale if we're going to be able to meet global emissions targets. So I feel on the one hand optimistic, but on the other hand, it seems like a mixed message. What, what is your read? Well, we're, we're evolving and, and I, I share the same reading that you do. I, I was in Europe about oh, over a month ago on business. The European Commission announced at that time their policy for energy transition, which included, Danielle, two things. Nuclear, they said mm -hmm. we're going to do more nuclear until 2050. We'll phase some of it out when we get there. And we're going to do more natural gas. This is Europe. This is the Europe that is, was the lead on Glasgow and the lead on why? Because common sense dictates that if you want to decarbonize, you've got to get the transition right. And if you don't, you end up in an energy crisis, which, by the way, was happening in Europe before the war in, the, in Ukraine, actually before. And so these are the things that Canadians understand. People in the oil patch, they get that. And they ask for nothing better than to be part of the overall plan that allows us to transition, to do it intelligently and, and continue to reduce the carbon intensity of the oil produced in the West. I mean, one of the frustrations in the West that I fully understand is the lack of, total lack of acknowledgement, total, of all the efforts that have been made in the last 20 years. It's as though nothing had been done. When in fact, whether it's the reduction of the use of water or the, redu or the reduction in carbon intensity, a great deal has been done. And, and, and Western Canada should be in the industry rewarded for that or, and, and recognize the tax credit you're talking about is a very positive step in that direction for carbon cap capture and storage. 
and for other forms of, of renewables. Do, do you think there's a recognition as well um, on First Nations sovereignty, how, how many First Nations are developing their sovereignty around having a partnership with the energy industry? I mean, I look at the, our energy industry as being at the forefront of the, the reconciliation discussion. Do you think that's appreciated elsewhere? I don't think I don't think people uh, generally in Canada know how many, for, for example, members of, of Indigenous groups are working in the energy uh, sector. I'm guessing the energy sector is probably the sector that employs the most uh, Indigenous uh, Canadians. And uh, and yet, people don't know that. The other change uh, that people are not aware of is that the movement and the change within the communities is one of, of wanting to be owners, having equity in the par in the projects as opposed to being renters. And that's everywhere in Canada. And, and it varies a lot according to each community because their level of development may vary. But the trend, Danielle, that you described very well, the trend line is very, very clear. Here are these communities who are moving towards wanting to be owners and equity partners in these projects, learning, training their own people. And that's a very positive development as long as we let it happen and, and make it, make it an, an easier path as possible for them to become equity partners in projects. All right. I, I know that you're you're almost out of time. I appreciate the time you've given us, but I want to end on a, a note talking about COVID policy and what needs to change there. So one of the things that we do at Alberta Enterprise Group is we have trade missions. And I must tell you, it's really awkward and complicated to try to do a w trade mission to Washington when you don't know whether or not your vaxxed or unvaxxed uh, uh, companions are going to be able to go or come back. Are you going to have to have testing or you're not going to have testing? The, the There is a real concern on, from a charter point of view that we're not respecting section six mobility rights of people to be able to enter and leave the country to get on a plane to go and see either <laughs> family across the country or internationally there's a whole variety of uncertainty i think around whether justin trudeau is going to implement his ban on unvaccinated workers working in federally regulated industries which includes trucking and rail and ports and crtc and broadcast industry so th there i think that there's still a lot of uncertainty being layered on at the federal level that's really impacting the business community's ability to move forward what would you do about that i was on a task force of the wilson center in washington the think tank with the uh, two uh, ex-governors from the United States and Anne McClellan, actually, of the was deputy prime minister under Mr. Martin, we produced a report in, on the on the closing of the border. It was on the border, and one of the things that we noticed, uh, Danielle, was the lack of uh, collaboration between both sides, mm -hmm. and the fact that the simple closing of the border created a lot, a lot of uh, problems for uh, people on both sides, for families, for people who were married, people, and, and unnecessarily. We could have very well applied a science-based approach that simplified access from one side to the other, and it needs to be simplified as much as possible. Clearly, I, and I've traveled recently, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, f filling in the forms, doing the test, doing the PCR test, the antigenic test, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I think the government has overcomplicated that, uh, that process. Canada is one of the countries with whom for whom it was the most complicated. Now, did we get much better outcomes than elsewhere? I don't think so. Uh, not from, from what I've seen. I traveled to Europe. It was a lot simpler <coughs> in Europe. And so now is the time to move to the endemic stage. We're going to continue to rely on scientists, and we should. I mean, we, you know, there's no reason not to. Every province is different. But let's, let's take as simple as, as possible, make it as simple as possible, straightforward as possible, safe as possible, and that's what will work. Okay, let's, let, just last question for you. You've got a, a number of competitors who've come into the, the race as well. Why, why should people vote, vote for you over one of the other candidates? I will unite the Conservative Party. I will make this party a, a united and a, a party that's uh, able to include all those who are Conservatives in the country and, and without them being hyphenated. There will be no hyphenated Conservatives in, in the party that I will lead. And I, I will, we will develop a, a plan and a vision for the country. And I am the candidate in this race, Danielle, who will deliver a national government, a majority national government for Canadians. All right, Mr. Charest, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Danielle. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, that was Jean Charest. Once again, he is a candidate for the federal leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada.
All right, there you have it. So we did an earlier recording on that. And uh, Kim, I see your message. What is Mr. Mr. Charest's view of the current debt? I apologize, we were not able to get to um, to all of the, 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 the questions. And so if we can have them back, I'll make sure that I make note of that. Some candidates, as you know, are leading with that with that issue. And and so when we uh, when we line up uh, Pierre Polyev and Patrick Brown, I'll be interested in seeing what they have to say on that. All right, we also did another interview with Leslyn Lewis, and you have seen her before. I think she got introduced to to Canada in the last Conservative Party of Canada leadership race. She did get elected as well, so she's got some experience now in elected office. And she also joined me earlier in the week. Uh, to share her views on why it is. She's put her her name back in the race to attempt this time around to be Conservative Party leader. Here's, here's our interview from earlier this week. All right, welcome again as we continue with our series interviewing candidates for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. Joining me now is a face that will be very memorable to many of you as she ran last time around. She's running again. Her name is Dr. Leslie Lewis and she joins us now. Dr. Lewis, thanks so much for being with us. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So tell me, how has it been the experience since your last time uh, last time running? What have, you, what have you learned that you think better prepares you for running this time around? Well, there's lots that I've learned. I've, just the system of how to um, mobilize the grassroots, um, how to motivate people to support you, uh, getting your team together. I have the same team as I did last time. So I have the same campaign manager, Steve Outhouse, and we basically have the, the same team um, that's supporting me. And so it's, it's great to be able to start from a place of not behind Daniel this time because we have our infrastructure in place. And so we could get right into uh, doing the job of, of um, running the leadership race rather than before. We had to gear up a lot and um, do things on the fly, but this time it seems more um, orderly and, um, and things are already in place. So, All right. Well, the world has changed a lot since the last time around. So I want to talk to you about the geopolitical environment we find ourselves in and then bring it closer to home. Let, let's begin by, by talking about the, the situation in Ukraine and, and with the uh, Russian invasion. What, what, what do you think we need to be prepared for in Canada as, as a fallout of, of that action, how long it's going to take and what we need to be able to do to support our allies? Yeah, well, I think the first thing we need to do is we really, need, everybody really takes the invasion very, very seriously. And because when you look at the situation, we share a border with Russia also, the Arctic. And so if if Russia can impose and invade Ukraine, then we should be very, very concerned that that could be a possibility for us also. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to think about our military strategy and some of our vulnerabilities. And one vulnerability is having um, Make, just making sure that we have a well-funded military and that we can protect our Arctic borders. And we're seeing encroachment on our Arctic borders. And that's something that we will have to up um, input into our technology and our ability to defend our borders. For example, Russia has 40, um, 40 submarines that, that have uh, torpedo launches and icebreakers. Um, we don't have any icebreakers. Mm -hmm. And so that level of vulnerability has to be acknowledged and, and making sure that not only are we there for our allies, but we are also able to protect our own borders. Um, I, I think something else that we have to look at, to be honest, Danielle, is just the, the um, how our natural resource strategy is tied to our natural national security strategy. And it's very important that we become self-sufficient, that we develop our natural resources, and that can always be done in an environmentally sustainable manner. But when we look at the reality of the fact that we have not been able to get our LNG to tide water, it means that European countries are purchasing 40% of their LNG capacity from Russia. Mm -hmm. And so in effect, our inability to develop our natural resources and offset um, Russian oil and gas in, in um, Europe 
is really actually putting money in the pockets of dictatorships like Russia, which is emboldening them to be able to in, in, invade countries like Ukraine. And so our national um, security strategy has to be tied to uh, developing our natural resources. And that means that we're going to have to uh, reconcile the fact that we're going to have to build pipelines in order to efficiently transport our products and get them to Tidewater. Tell me what you think we need to do since you've, you've had some time in, in Ottawa. You, you obviously have spent time in Quebec. What is it that we need to do to have a breakthrough in Quebec? Because we, it looked to me like we were going to. Uh, Premier Jason Kenney had talked to Premier Francois Legault about the ability to export Western gas off the, the coast of, of Quebec, which is the most efficient route to get it to Europe. And yet now we've seen in recent in recent months that the premier has announced he's going to ban the extraction of oil and gas in Quebec. They've canceled the Port Saguenay project, which would have helped us to export LNG. We have also had politicians campaign against pipelines, most specifically the Energy East and more recently. How do we turn that around? What do you think the the, the way that we can appeal to Quebec so that they don't stand in the way of this, of this in, international imperative and the national interest? Well, the issue is, is that Quebec has been very successful in um, transitioning to more of green energy types, and they have natural, uh, they, they are able to use their natu natural strengths such as um, hydroelectric power. And the West is also asking for the same because their strength would be LNG. And the reality is, is that we, we still are importing oil and as long as we're importing oil, it should be Canadian. We, we should have a reliance on Canadian oil. We should prefer our own resources rather than foreign resources. And so I think that what needs to be done is um, the land, lines of communication just have to be opened. Um, Quebecers want to make sure that, that the rest of the country understands their special needs and their special contributions. And I think that it's just we, we need more dialogue to facilitate um, policies that are in the best interest of, of different regions and just bringing out the strengths of different regions. So there's been a lot of work in the energy sector. You've probably seen that the big five oil sands company have pledged to be net zero by 2050. And the, there are a number of different energy companies that are working on net zero strategies, how to use carbon technology to capture carbon dioxide, use it for useful products and store it. Is, uh, give, me, give me your sense of whether or not any of that is breaking through. Do you, th do you think that that messaging from the energy sector is getting any currency in the rest of the country? Well, I think it's important that when we talk about net zero calculations, net zero strategies, that the term is properly defined because a part of the problem that we have in politics is that we use terms and the average person doesn't, doesn't know what comprises these terms. And sometimes that leads to having policies with no end result. So for me, when I think about something that's net zero, I'm looking at an entire life cycle of a product. So if you look at, for example, the entire life cycle of wind turbines or the entire life cycle of solar panels, or take another example, the entire life cycle of say electric vehicles. And then you, you have to look at the efficiency and you have to start from um, where do you get the parts from, from these vehicles, who mines them, uh, um, how are the batteries disposed of? And that has to be taken into the entire equation. And so we can't just say it's cleaner to drive electric vehicles and we don't think about the entire production, um, which can be far dirtier than um, carbon um, products. And so when you look at even like say the human impact of abused children working in cobalt mines in, in places like the Congo, um, you, you have to think about those things and ask yourself, um, is this product really greener? And so what we need to do, Danielle, I believe, is that we have to find policies that look at the outcome, the, the outcome on the environment. And we can't have net zero policies that just say, well, this product is, um, is greener uh, at a fixed period and we don't look at the entire life cycle.
If you were a conservative leader, what would be your carbon emission strategy? It's changed quite a bit between um, the uh, between Stephen Harper and Andrew Shear and your more recent leader, Aaron O'Toole. Where, where do you fall on carbon pricing, carbon taxes, um, LNG exports you've already talked about, but what do you see the, the mix of policies that will address greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I, I think that it's important that when we look at something like the carbon tax, we have to recognize that currently the people that are paying the lion's share of the carbon tax are those who can least afford it. It's on the backs of the average Canadian. It's every time you go to the pumps. It's every time you heat your home. And in sectors like the agricultural sector, it's it's for, um, for drying your crops. Um, and these are the areas and the people that can least afford it. So I think that the individual carbon tax is something that's um, very discriminatory and very, very punitive. I prefer policies of education, policies that will change behavior, that will um, encourage people to change the way that they interact with the environment um, by reducing um, by, by reducing emissions in, in just how you use your products by conserving. Con conservation is probably the biggest bang for environmental protection. And if we have educational um, programs that facilitate that, I think that that is a more effective way to, to change behavior. Because if you look at the carbon tax, for it to really have an impact, Daniel, what you'll have to do is you'd have to raise it to about 40, 40 times mm -hmm. uh, where it is now for it to have an impact of people, I'm not driving anymore, or I'm, I'm actually going to put on my coat and not heat my, my home. Um, that's the level that you have to get to. And so right now, what, what our government is doing, what I see the policies are, they're saying, okay, well, if you want to pollute, pay to pollute. To me, that's inherently offensive that somebody can pay to pollute, um, that doesn't solve the environmental problem. The environment is not for sale, Daniel. And so my policies that I would like to see is to actually change behavior, not just give people a free ticket, say, okay, well, if you, if you can afford to, you can pollute as much as you can. And so you have the wealthy people that it doesn't impact on them because they can continue with their lifestyles. It doesn't mean um, putting food on the table because they, they have to get to work. And so the carbon tax that they're paying um, is higher because they, they, they drive further distances to work and they have fewer dollars in their pockets. And so they may have to compensate with, um, with food. That doesn't happen to a, a wealthy person. And so that's why I, I don't believe in the individual carbon tax. All right. Talk to me a bit about where we should be looking for our alliances when it comes to just a range of policies. I think of carbon taxes and, car and carbon policy as being central, because one of the things that Stephen Harper said is that we had to have parity with the United States. Under this current regime with Justin Trudeau, there seems to be closer ties that are, are being made with, with China. There's also looking at Europe. Europe is, has taken a view that green bonds should apply to nuclear and to natural gas, which we haven't. It, it feels like Canada is a little rudderless. Where, where do you think our alignment should be when we're talking about uh, our not only our issues around CO2, but our issues around supporting uh, geopolitical changes and defense policy, international trade, that the, the world is in a state of flux. How, how, where do you see Canada's place in it? Yeah, um, I, things have really changed. And so the geopolitical lines have been really, really blurred. Um, and even, even the U.S., we used to be able to count on them as an unfailing ally. And during COVID, we saw that there were certain resources, certain equipment that we needed that the U.S. had, but they retained it for their citizens. And rightly so, they, they put their country first. And I think that what's what we need to do is we need to get back to the basics and start um, bringing our supply chains home, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that we are self-sufficient, that we're not um, reliant on other countries for basic 
necessities. I think that what we need to do is to develop, start developing our natural resources and creating, enabling legislation and looking at the legislations that that has really penalized our industry and also that has pushed other has pushed corporations away um the energy sector is investment in that sector is a long-term investment and when you have precarious laws what happens is, is that companies gravitate to other areas so when you have laws like bill c48 and bill c69 um which favors actually foreign com companies over our own mm -hmm. oil production, then you'll see that people do not want to invest in developing here. And so th that's a big problem. But I think that as an initial step, I would want to see negotiations started on Keystone and, and trying to um, really, really mend whatever whatever um problems we had why we had to why why that was stopped i think we need to um restart conversations on that because even with the interruption of uh, um oil from russia you see that the united states has turned to venezuela mm -hmm. so it's almost as if they would prefer to import oil from dictatorship regimes than from us. And so we need to have some discussions about that and and find ways that we could we could resolve that because I think that having the third largest accessible oil reserves on the planet is a benefit benefit not only to us Daniel but it's a benefit to our neighbors. It's a benefit to the US. And so we have to get beyond um what what the problems were that led to halting of the keystone pipeline. Yeah, and what about the other pipelines that are currently underway but facing challenges? The Trans Mountain Pipeline, we've heard from Christian Freeland that obviously with cost escalations, she says she doesn't want any more federal tax dollars going into it, uh, as well as the Coastal Gas Link line that was uh, sabotaged during, uh, I think there was a lot of attention paid to the Freedom Convoy, but at the same time, there was a $20 million worth of damage done to equipment on the side of the coastal gas link. What, what needs to be done to get those projects to the finish line? Well, I think we need the resolve to, to develop our natural resources, even in the face of um, foreign interference. And, and a lot of those, uh, a lot of the delays were caused by um, foreign interference. And when we look at the protesters, many of them were not even from Canada. Mm -hmm. They came from the United States, and they were tied to um, radical uh, extremist groups that um, that were focused on shutting down the development of our oil sector. Um, and it's it's really hypocritical because at the same time we continue to import foreign oil from regimes and countries with far less environmental standards than ours, far less human rights records than ours and yet we continue to import oil from those regimes and it's it's one thing to say well we don't have the resources to build that that's that's not true we do have the resources um to to build those pipelines and then another excuse that is used is that well we don't have the time well if we had started danielle <laughs> um years ago six years ago we would be in a very good place right now we would not be in the precarious position that we are right now um, with respect to this situation that we see, especially over with Russia and the Ukraine. E essentially, our inability to act is putting money in the pockets of, of Russia mm -hmm. and that and, and enabling them to invade places like the Ukraine. So I don't think, I think we just need the political resolve and the political will to do this. But it is something that we have to be done because it's intricately tied to our national security. Let, let's talk about First Nations involvement as well. There have been an amazing number of First Nations leaders who have stepped forward through the National Coalition of Chiefs with Dale Swampy and the um, Indian Resource Council, Stephen Buffalo, Ellis Ross in British Columbia, 
do, so in the West, there seems to be a real um, reconciliation effort being led around economic reconciliation. And I'm wondering if that's being observed. Do, do, do people recognize that there's a, a fundamental change in the relationship with First Nations communities and a fundamental buy-in that there isn't uniform op opposition to these kinds of projects? There's, in fact, if you look at self-actualization and sovereignty, some of these pro projects are going to be essential to First Nations sovereignty. Do you think that's acknowledged? Um, well, I think the Conservative Party is trying to get that message out there that developing our natural resources is something that is in line with reconciliation. It's in line with First Nation sovereignty. And many of these projects, there are um, resource sharing agreements with First Nation community in place. And the real hurtful thing, Danielle, is that when you see these protesters damaging uh, property and, and attempting to to stop the certain projects. The people that are hurt um, deeply are our First Nations communities who have these resource sharing agreements that will help lift certain communities out of poverty, um, will enrich those, those uh, nations, and also put us on a path to reconciliation. Because one part of reconciliation is, is the delivering on our commitments. And First Nations communities have heard over and over so many commitments from our government. Basic things like clean water, we're not able to provide. Well, they're at the point where they're saying, you know what, just give us the ability to do it ourselves. And we will enter into these contracts with you. We will partnership with you. We will build partnerships and we will provide these things. Um, this is a part of reconciliation is de delivering on your promises. And unfortunately, when you have uh, interruptions and, and protests and, and deliberate uh, acts such as Bill C-48 and Bill C-69 attempting to, to stymie this production, unfortunately, the First Nations communities are also suffering. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the the role that the federal government can play in future in even providing support for for communities. There, there's this new agreement between the Liberals and the NDs. It looks like it will see them have a coalition government until 2025. And a lot of the items on the table are big ticket items: national pharmacare, and national long term care, and national dental dental care. So something's got to give here. How how do you see the plan to getting back into balanced budget? Well. Canadians didn't vote for a liberal majority and NDP voters didn't vote for a liberal NDP coalition. Many NDP voters are very, very disappointed because um, they, they oppose things such as the liberal scandals. And so that, that coalition I'm sure is going to cause some tension amongst NDP voters. Um, and especially because Jagmeet, didn't really get much um, out of the deal. He doesn't have any uh, members of his caucus in cabinet, which is a true coalition. Uh, you also spoke about um, some of the policies. And for example, um, many of those policies are going to be fueled by deficit financing, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And um, even if you look at the, the, the universal drug plan, many Drug plans that exist right now that private members have are better than what the federal government would give them. And this is a $40 billion plan. Um, many individuals are paying for their own private plan. Even those who cannot afford to have their own private plans, provinces have their plans in place. And so even the province of Ontario, the province of Ontario, their plan is better than the federal plan. And so that gives you some sense of um, big government doesn't necessarily mean better. In Quebec, this is another issue um, and another concern for Quebec because Quebec has a plan. They mm -hmm. actually like their plan. They wanna keep their plan, but the federal plan would, would offset that. And so this is also a part of the problem that sometimes the, the federal government 
imposes on the provinces in areas that are already taken care of that they don't need to and they just form bigger more wasteful government a 40 billion dollar drug plan in areas such as ontario and quebec and, and other provinces who have already uh, things in place uh is is just a waste of money and it's and it's only going to be financed by bigger debt bigger bigger deficit I think a lot of Albertans are worried it's going to be financed through more uh, money being extracted from Alberta. You've probably seen that Albertans voted to try to end equalization. What would you do if um, Quebec, if Alberta wanted to uh, take more action? More action. Me, wanted to take more action to to try to end those programs. Um, are you speaking more? Are you speaking about like equalization? Correct. Equalization. Because here's the problem. Every time there is a national program, Albertans pay more than their fair share into it. And because we have less need, we end up getting fewer transfers back. That that deficit that we have across all of our programs is now a, a, approximately $26 billion that goes into Ottawa. Equalization is only one small part of that. But I think the perspective from Alberta is every time there's a new program being announced, Alberta taxpayers are going to pay a larger portion of it. How, how would you address that inequity? Well, I, I can see the point because, for example, even um, the average drug plan, some, some drug plans, they have a, a $15,000 cap, whereas the government plan is $4,500. So people having to switch to that, that would cause some some concern and with respect to albertans albertans are probably thinking well this 40 billion dollars we're the ones who are paying the lion's share of these transfer payments and um equalization i think is something that it's caused so much of a problem in our nation that we have to at least i think uh, out of goodwill sit down and say ask the question is there a more equitable formula and why I think that's important, Danielle, is because the last few years of COVID, when everybody was struggling, Alberta was also struggling, and yet the equalization formula re required that um, they still pay um, portions based on the calculations, and that calcul those calculations were from three years before. So that lag time didn't account for the two years of of famine per se so it count it, it it looked at the years of feast but not of famine and so what i think needs to happen is although it's something that's constitutionally based i think that provinces have to be realistic and reasonable and i think they are and sit down and say what is a reasonable resolution to this um, something else that I've heard Albertans speak a lot about, Danielle, is just the fact that the equalization formula is based on all the, the production in, in, and even the oil and gas sector, whereas there are some provinces that have opted out of fracking and other, um, other industries. And so Albertans have also proposed that maybe the equalization payments should uh, look at only certain sectors um, since other provinces do, don't uh, believe in, in developing these areas of resources, perhaps they wouldn't want to have um, uh, revenues based on that, er that area of production. So these are conversations. Um, we haven't come to any con conclusion about how they would look. But these are some conversations that I've heard Albertans raise and that I think that other parts of the country should uh, think about and perhaps come to the table and have meaningful, respectful decisions about how we can perhaps make it more equitable. All right. Let me ask you just a few questions about COVID. Our organization, uh, Albert Enterprise Group, is one that likes to do trade missions. But I can tell you the last couple of years hasn't been easy to do that. We've had conflicting rules. We've had difficulty leaving the country, difficulty entering testing rules. What needs to be done at the federal level to get back to normal? Well, um, 
I, I would say, Danielle, that if we look at what other countries are doing, other countries are transitioning to some level of um, normal living. And I think that we, as Canadians, we, we, we've taken things very, very slowly. Um, a number of Canadians still cannot travel. They still cannot board a plane, a, a train or a boat. Um, if they're unvaccinated, and that's causing a lot of problems for people visiting their elderly uh, family members abroad or, or other things. Um, and we know that we have things in place that can uh, transition us, such as testing. Other countries are able to do that. And so I think it's time that we, we got out of um, the zone of fear and we look at what other, other countries are doing and recognize that COVID is something that it seems that it's going to be with us for some time and it's uh, the virus seems to have mutated and we've had different strains and we other other countries have learned how to live with that. And I think that in order for us to rebound, to restart our economy and to create some security within the, the business sector, we have to start looking at accommodations and ways to to restart the economy. If you look at small businesses, they really, really took it really hard. And I went to a restaurant the other day and, she mm -hmm. said, and the owner said, I don't even know um, if we're gonna be able to come back. I'm so afraid that mm -hmm. we'll, we're going to have different rules imposed again, and then I'll be able to shut down. And I don't think I'm gonna be able to sustain another shutdown. And so I think that we have to look at, um, at accommodations, ways to live with the virus, and um, and look at what other jurisdictions have done to restart their economy. All right. Last question for you. You've got um, a growing field of candidates that you're running against. What would make uh, the, the Conservative Party different if you won? Why should people vote for you instead of some of the others? Well, Danielle, I come from a very non-political background. I have experience as an entrepreneur. I operated my own business, started it from the ground up, employed people. I know what it is to build wealth. I know what it is to put a paycheck on somebody's, uh, in someone's hand. Um, I know what it is to, um, to run a business. I've also taught at university. I've had life experiences uh, that the average Canadian can relate to. I haven't spent all my time in, in parliament. And, and so those life experiences, there's something that I will, I will bring to the table. I've been a, a university teacher. I've taught at Osgoode Hall Law School at the University of Toronto. I have international law experience representing Canadian companies selling their products abroad. And so I have that experience also. I'm also um, somebody who's an immigrant. And so I can reach out to people in the large urban centers who have that experience and who often sometimes didn't see themselves within the conservative party. And with me, um, they have a similar story, a similar mm -hmm. success story. We came here and we're no different. I came as a, as a small child, five years old. Um, so I don't know any other uh, country except my beloved country of Canada. Um, but the, the experience is that our parents came here for a better opportunity. And whether you're born here, Danielle, or whether you immigrated from another country, um, wh whatever your religious background, your sexual orientation, your persuasion, um, you all want the same thing. You want a prosperous country, a country where you can succeed, where your children will have a good education, where you have a home, um, that you can own and raise your family in. You can drive a car, you can provide good food for your family. These are some of the things that um, we all share and we all want Canada to, to succeed. And I think that my life experience is unique um, because I bring all of that to Parliament. And I think that I would be a very, very strong voice for uniting the entire country. All right. Well, thank you so much for the conversation today. I sure appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. It was my pleasure. That is Dr. Leslie Lewis, and she is a candidate, of course, for the federal leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. All right, my friends. So now you've heard from two of the leadership candidates.
It's funny, isn't it, how the world is now really centered around a lot of energy discussion. So whether it's energy security, whether it's energy affordability, which Dr. Lewis talked a lot about, or whether it's how do we develop resources with a, an eye to our environmental footprint. It, it, it seems like those are, are thrust front and center, whether you're dealing with international, national, or even local politics. If I missed anything, and I'm sure I did, please send me an email and let me know what you would like me to ask the upcoming candidates. It's uh, danielle at albertaenterprisegroup.com. We're going to line the other two up so that you'll have a chance to listen to at least the four main contenders. If there are other contenders who enter into the race that look like they they have a good chance of, of winning, then I will interview them too. If you've got another suggestion for who I should add to that list, let me know. But at the moment, it seems to me that this is going to come to, down to a race between Dr. Leslie Lewis, Jean Charest, Pierre Polyev, and Patrick Brown. So I uh, would love your thoughts on this. We're out of time for the week, but we will be back at it again next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Danielle Smith, president of Alberta Enterprise Group. Thanks again.